Welcome to our worship on this Sunday, which is the closest to the feast of St Gilbert of Semprium, which was the 4th of February. He founded a monastery at Semprium, nine miles from here, in 1131. He's the only Englishman to have started a monastic order. He was a man of great faith and great determination, overcoming disability and ridicule in order to follow God's will for him. In our worship today, we hear his story and learn from his life and faith. We now prepare for our worship. I advise you to find a quiet and comfortable place to sit while you watch and listen. You may wish to light a candle to signify that Jesus is the light of the world and to show that we now make particular time and space for him. We have a few moments of quiet before we begin our worship. We come to our prayer of preparation, which we say together. We confess to you, Lord, what we are. We're not the people we like others to think we are. We are afraid to admit even to ourselves what lies in the depths of our souls. But we do not want to hide our true selves from you. We believe that you know us as we are and you love us. Help us not to shrink from self-knowledge. Teach us to respect ourselves for your sake. Give us the courage to put our trust in your guiding power. Raise us out of the paralysis of guilt into the freedom and energy of forgiven people. And for those who through long habit find forgiveness hard to accept, we ask you to break their bondage and set them free. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
the collect for the feast of St Gilbert of Semprio. Lord God, through whose grace St Gilbert enriched your church with a new order of religious life, grant us the same obedience to your will and openness to the needs of others that all may gain the good things prepared for those who believe in you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The lesson is taken from Luke chapter 12, beginning to read at verse 32. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father is pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell all your belongings and give the money to the poor. Provide for yourselves purses that don't wear out and save your riches in heaven, where they will never decrease because no thief can get to them and no moth can destroy them. For your heart will always be where your riches are. Be ready for whatever comes, dressed for action and with your lamps lit, like servants who are waiting for their master to come back from the wedding feast. When he comes and knocks, they will open the door for him at once. How happy are those servants whose master finds them awake and ready when he returns. I tell you, he will take off his coat, ask them to sit down, and will wait for them. Here ends the lesson. Are you sitting comfortably? I'm going to share with you a version of the story of St Gilbert of Semprium. Jocelyn was my father, knight and proud owner of these lands and people, Alfred of Lincoln's man in peace and war. Proud to be an invader, proud to be a Norman, proud to speak a proper language and proud to bring order and sophistication to the benighted Saxons. Well, just stick with proud and you've got the picture. He sailed with William of Normandy, and though I don't suppose for a minute that Duke William, the Conqueror, would know him from Adam, he did get a piece of another man's reward. My mother? Dear old Capgrave, John, my biographer, will tell you that she was Lady of Sempringham. Well, she certainly was a woman of distinction and courage, but she was also a Saxon of a lower rank, you know. Presumably her family thought she'd gone up in the world and the natives couldn't complain too much if one of their own had married the overlord. They had me in about 1083. I don't remember the event, otherwise I would certainly have made a note of the date. I was a bitter disappointment. I had, as it is so thoughtfully described, a repulsive physical deformity. I was not going to be a shining example of Norman manhood. I was not going to be an esquire or a knight. I was not going to ride into battle and I was not going to be Alfred of Lincoln's man in peace and war. I was given over into the care of my lower rank mother and that was the making of me. She believed in education and while my peers got thwacked in the tilting yard, blooded in the hunt and learned to drink and swear in a manly way, I devoured all that my tutors could serve up to me in the way of learning. My mother was a compassionate woman given to acts of mercy. I learned compassion and anyway, I knew what it was to be different, to be despised. 
My mother was a truly devout woman and taught me that love of others had its origin in the love of God and the actions of Christ. I learned Christian devotion and a be good job too, said my father, as the B church was the only thing I was B good for. To be frank, I was a laughing stock to my father, his men, the servants, but I was young. And just because I could not fulfill other people's dreams of knighthood did not mean I did not have dreams of my own. To build schools, to give my life to the Lord, to champion those who were on the receiving end of ill-treatment and injustice. I began to teach the children of the household in the village and to engage in pastoral care and teaching the faith. Winning souls for Christ, in the words of Capgrave, although I say it myself, I was pretty good at it. My mother was proud of me, and so it turned out was my father who one day presented me with the livings of Sempringham, with its newly rebuilt church of St Andrew, and that of Torrington nearby. I was appointed a chaplain, and another chaplain came to join me, a chap named Geoffrey, and we moved into the parvis of St Andrew's church. It was a bit of a squash, but we were good mates, and both fired up by our mission. Afterwards, we built ourselves a two-bedroom cottage in the churchyard and joked that at least we had quiet neighbours. By 11.31, there had been two major changes in my life. I had been ordained priest, and my father had died, making me lord of the manor. I was my own man, and could now do the thing I so wanted, found a monastery. It should have been no surprise to me, given the different attitudes that I saw in my parents to the demands of faith, that my first seven postulants were all women. A cloister was constructed for them on the north side of the church. Once men saw that things were not going to be a total flop, they joined in. The thing snowballed. With lay brothers and lay sisters, we'd soon outgrown our nest and Gilbert of Gand, local landowner, gave three caricates of land in the valley on which to build a priory. Alexander, Bishop of Lincoln, had to be in on the act, of course. There's nothing bishops like better than a successful initiative to muscle in on, and so he gave money and insisted we started a nunnery on the Isle of Haverholm over towards Sleaford. I had set out to win souls for Christ, not administer an ecclesiastical empire. We needed a religious rule and structure, and then someone else could run the thing and leave me to be a monk. I arranged to go with some Cistercian colleagues to their general chapter at Citeaux, and well, I ended up in the gentle but firm hands of Bernard of Clairvaux who sorted me out and, as well as being my mentor, became my lifelong friend. I'd now entered the realms of the great and the good and attracted the patronage of none other than King Henry himself. That was all well and good until he picked a fight with his archbishop. If it came to choosing allegiance to church or state, there was no contest for me. We actually helped our, our Archbishop Thomas a Becket escaped from the King's clutches at one stage. I say we, but as I was 81-ish by this stage, I was not part of the adventure, sadly. Of course, Henry didn't like it, threatened us all with exile. But I said that, as a loyal son of the Church, I was unlikely to have done otherwise when the Archbishop's life was at stake. Courtly gasps all round, but I think the King respected my nerve. And anyway, as the only English religious order, with no mother house abroad, all our revenues went to the Crown. I had some good priors in my houses and could spend my time travelling around, 
teaching, preaching, admonishing where need be, and giving comfort where need be, and still winning souls for Christ. It was a simple and fulfilling life. I'd had a good innings, but I was not as young as I used to be. A hundred and six is not a bad age for someone with a repulsive physical deformity. I slipped from this world just after matins on the 4th of February, 1189. Capgrave will have it that it was a Saturday, the Sabbath, the day of rest, so it was a convenient day for me to go. I'm so glad I didn't cause any inconvenience. There was a big fussy funeral, of course, all pomp and prelates. They surely must have known I would have loathed it. And then there was all sorts of nonsense about miracles and a canonization, would you believe it? How about that, Dad? I was no good as a, good as a knight, but I made it as a saint. We're all saints. I only did what any Christian tries to do, follow the path that God has laid out for us. It's usually quite different from the one we envisage, but we just have to step out and trust. We now come to our prayers. Let us pray. For all those down the centuries who have lit the lives of others with joy. For those who have upheld others in tenderness and for those who give us a vision of heaven. And especially on this day for Saint Gilbert of Semprium. Holy God, within and among us, hear us. As we celebrate Gilbert's life of steadfast love and his acceptance and cherishing of the vocation and spiritual life of others without condition or constraint, we pray for all those who are currently discerning a vocation to ministry or the religious life especially for those within our own group of parishes. Holy God, within and among us, hear us. We give thanks for Gilbert's skill as a teacher and pastor and for his humility in the service of God's people. 
We pray for all who are teaching and learning under very difficult conditions at this time. We pray for all teachers of the faith and all who are undertaking ministries of service. Holy God, within and among us, hear us. We give thanks for Gilbert's vision of his monastic life, his courage in seeking a rule, and his commitment to God's will. We ask God to bless us with a willingness to seek and fulfil his will for us. Holy God, within and among us, hear us. We celebrate all those who followed in the footsteps of St Gilbert, in the religious life and the order that he founded. We pray for all those who embrace the life of a religious. We give thanks for all monastic houses and the spiritual benefits they offer to others. Holy God, within and among us, hear us. We give thanks for all those who have walked before us in the journey of faith and for all those who will follow after us. We pray especially for all those who have lost their lives in this pandemic and for all who mourn them. Holy God, within and among us, hear us. Amen. And we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen.
And finally, we come to the blessing. May God, who kindled the fire of his love in the heart of St. Gilbert of Semprium, pour upon you the riches of his grace. May he give you joy in his fellowship and a share in his praises. May he strengthen you to follow Gilbert in the way of holiness and to come to the full radiance of the saints in glory and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you this day and always. Amen.